Hi everybody, welcome. And I just wanted to say before we kick off on this inaugural Bendigo Writers Festival Book Club, um, that we're celebrating the power and place of story in our lives tonight. And I join you from the lands of the Jar Jar Wurrung, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as the elders past, present and emerging of the lands from which you are joining us. For they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes for Australia's first peoples. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So if you want to pop in your um, chat panel where you're joining us from, if you're not on Judge Albarang uh, land, uh, that would be fantastic so that we can acknowledge where we're all from. Kate, welcome. Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm just typing mine in because I'm joining you from the uh, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here. Fantastic. And it, I've got I've got the start. I know you you are all going to get a bit more rain than me. I've just got very light rain on the at the moment on my tin roof, so it's quite yeah. lovely. We've had rain today. My roses okay. are, are completely soaked, but I didn't need to tell you that. <laughs> um, so, Kate, lots of people will know you, uh, but for those who don't know you, the Mother Fault is only your second novel ever. Yes. And you are a writer and a teacher, and your uh, first novel, Skylarking, was long listed for the Voss Literacy, uh, Literary, Literary Prize in 2017 and the Indie Book Awards uh, of 2017. And I don't think you could get two books more different <laughs> to one another. We'll, we'll come back and talk about that uh, again. You, you're a podcaster. Uh, you're a mum, you're dealing with a whole lot of stuff, and I suspect that quite a lot of it has found its way into uh, the mother fault. Um, Indeed. Yeah. So I wanted to start by asking you, um, I always love a title that is so deeply layered with metaphor, allegory, symbolism, trope, angst, whatever you like to say. And to me, the mother fault is... A title that so neatly wraps up everything that this book is how on earth did you come up with that title I love that I love that question Sarah thank you um, it, it certainly wasn't in the beginning so for a long time the book was called you know borderless or borderful there were all these words around border I knew that it was the working title that it wouldn't be that and then what I did this time Partly because in my experience of writing Skylarking, when I came to publication, I was floored by the fact that I, I couldn't kind of remember when I got to do events like this, I couldn't remember the order in which things happened when I edited things or how ideas came to me. So this time I determined that I would, I would journal the whole process. So I've got this 150,000 word journal of the writing of the mother fault. And in fact, I found the moment where I came upon the title and I hadn't remembered it, but I'd, I'd been playing and I had, I, I loved Sally Piper's book, The Geography of Friendship. And of course, having this geography um, metaphor going through the book. So I was playing around with the geographer and all these ideas. But, but at that stage, Mim had stolen the story and, and she was so important. And of course, playing with those ideas of the, um, tectonic of the you know all that area in indonesia and and um the kind of geographical um tension in that zone um i i just wrote it down the words came out the mother fault and of course i rang my mum to tell her because you do these things and she said okay you can't call it that like straight up her her initial response and i think i know what it is now was this idea that putting the words mother and fault so close together was um she, she just that went against every feminist bone in her body and and it was like this idea that no you're you're putting that idea out in the world um that it is the mother's fault and of course that's what i wanted to play with and she's come around now but i knew also because her response was so visceral that it would be the kind of provocative title that i needed to make people pick it up too so that's yeah. the long answer to that question oh, no 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 that's fantastic um because i i um when I first picked it up, I thought, oh, the mother, I thought the same thing. I thought, oh, yeah. well, you know, mothers get blamed for everything. For everything. Uh, and um, 
I, I love the way the book starts and in fact one of the we, we've been uh, for those of you who haven't been following Kate um, and me on Instagram in the last few days we've been uh, having a, a conversation about how badly I have defaced Kate's I've book. I've loved it. I'm a defacer <laughs> too so I, I, I very much enjoyed that. It's fantastic. I think Cecile Shanahan's defaced her copy even more. <laughs> but I, I just loved it when you introduce us to, to Min, the, the main character, the, the mother of, of the title in the book and uh, she's failed. She's done another epic fail to her uh, you know, grumpy teenage daughter, yep. Essie and you throw out this line after Essie holds out on her screen the friendship project it's it's something that her mother hasn't signed so she can't take part in and you just say there is always something else and I just thought oh yeah this is what this book is about this woman is clearly going to struggle with everything that she comes across and she's going to be blamed for a whole lot of things. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about uh, the, the, all the, in terms of the, the writer's craft of it, we're going to jump backwards and forwards here because it's a book club. So I don't have to be, uh, do anything in any order. order. What I want to start with is how on earth do you, put a, a book hook in like that without doing a spoiler alert? <laughs> well, I suppose, it, I suppose in that idea that, that, that um, terrible things continue to, to happen to Mim throughout the, the whole book. Um, and, and I had to keep upping the stakes for her, of course, Sarah, because things just kept getting worse and and worse and worse and that that's the nature of how we write plot uh, of course um i i knew right from the very start the idea came from this um particular particular frustration that i was experiencing four years ago as as i'm sure many of your book clubbers would have been experiencing which is i uh, i was deeply um angry at our at our government and continue often to be um for their treatment of asylum seekers and uh and i also had two much younger kids then my girls now are are seven and nine but but they were obviously smaller then and i and i i, I couldn't get my head around this idea that I was so frustrated with my kids daily at that stage i still had you know a, a toddler really i was doing a lot of um being in the home i was trying to write and i couldn't write um and yet i was watching and completely um empathizing with women who were leaving their homes forced to leave their homes forced to put themselves and their children in danger in in search of this this better life and the two ideas kept just crashing up against each other for me because they they ultimately made me feel terrible and guilty that I was experiencing those emotions. And yet I watched all the women and my friends around me and the, the mums at school and, and the people that I was um, friends with on social media who were saying like, I can't, I can't do this. You know, they've got all the privileges of this life that many of us have in Australia. And yet this is, this is going to get the better of me. This really will get the better of me being a mother. So they were the two ideas that I really wanted to, um, crash up against each other and of course as projects do it, it changed a lot along the way I said before Mim kind of stole the show and and as I realized what I would have to do to get her on a boat with her kids which was the image that I was always working towards it was the first image I'd written a a very kind of satirical sonnet about um at, at that stage oh. I was right in power then. I don't know who was in power. Whoever was in power, we've changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, that I'd, I'd written this kind of satirical sonnet about him, you know, having to get his parents out on a boat. And I wanted to play with that idea. Um, so I always knew she was going to get on a boat. And then, of course, I had to create a, a context which was dangerous enough for her to, to leave. And, um, 
And for a while that was an individual kind of a situation because of course, so many women, uh, so many people, but women in particular in this country have to leave um, their situations in their homes for many reasons, often they're dangerous reasons. Um, but I knew I needed it to be bigger than that. And so then I had to go and write a whole dystopian authoritarian government and it, it, it became a much bigger project than Sarah. Yeah. And what's really scary is you must have the top of the line crystal ball <laughs> no. uh, without giving any um, spoilers away, everybody. This is a, deeply chilling socio-ecological thriller and how did you know <laughs> that some of the things you were writing about then were going to be happening now well i i absolutely didn't know and it has been as kind of surreal and as terrifying for me watching um what has happened this year i was in kind of final edits um at the at the start of the year in you know kind of in march as we started getting this rhetoric from our government that we were all in this together and mm -hmm. you know and i'm reading over my my book and doing the copy final kind of proofs and going hang on i've written that line in in this book but i think you know what i was doing my research on and what i was spending so much time reading about over the last four years while i was researching this book were governments where that slippage into authoritarianism has has happened so it's by no means um you know something that hasn't happened before we have governments that get into power and then people hand over quite willingly often um with great hope to a, to a new power. And then of course, um, little by little, that kind of uh, society is undermined and the citizens' rights are undermined. So uh, I, I was looking to lots of other places where, where that has happened. And I was, I was stressed about ideas about surveillance and privacy. I think all of us are in some way or another, people with kids, maybe more so as they try to navigate this space as the kids get their own devices and what am I going to do about privacy? What about my own privacy? If I'm going to be on social media, like what rights do I give away? Um, so they were things that were all in my head. Um, and I've all, and I've always been keenly interested, I suppose, in the way that, that governments, um, ask us to do things in, in the name of, of the whole society. And, it's been difficult, Sarah. I have caught myself a couple of times because when I was originally going to planning the release of this book, you know, I was thinking about what I was going to write while I was signing in person in all the bookshops I was going to visit around the country anyway. And, um, I was going to write resist as a very mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, ideological idea that, that one should always resist and go against the, the mainstream. And then of course, now it's taken on this entirely different political ideal and I don't want to be <laughs> scooped up into a group with conspiracy theorists. And so I had to really quickly backpedal and, and, and I think I've really enjoyed um, some of the con commentary that I've seen um, from people who are saying that you can support your government and you can support a leader and, and what they're doing and you can still question them they still must be held to account because I think that's this kind of black and white, this anger that we see so much playing out in our media and on social media as well mm -hmm. is this idea that, you know, oh, you, well, you can't criticize, you know, Daniel Andrews as an example, mm -hmm. um, because that will undo everything. But on the other hand, people are saying, well, you, you can ask questions, you can hold people to account. So that, that idea that I suppose I was exploring was that the, the citizens need to pay attention to what's happening around them. So um, a couple of things that I, that I want to lead on from that. But first of all, I'm conscious that we said to people, you didn't have to have read the book to join this discussion. And I never like to leave people out. Uh, Kate Folds has just said, this book reminds her of The Handmaid's Tale. Yes, I was saying to someone today, I, I think it's The Love Child of The Handmaid's Tale and 1984. Ah, what a uh, with wonderful description thank you Sarah. <laughs> so let's just take everybody back the book opens there's mim she's in the kitchen so she's she's the mum she's uh, clearly uh, we get the sense that she's there by herself we don't quite know why is she a single mum what's going on she's got uh these two children who are, aren't particularly um appreciative of the work that that she's doing and then we discover that 
Ben is missing. Yeah. Can you take a and moment? so, so Ben, Mim's husband is missing from his work on an Indonesian mine site. So he's an engineer. He's been over there and Mim is, you know, kind of annoyed at first um, when she finds this out. She, she's angry at him. She's been at home for the last 11 years raising these kids. And, you know, there's this element that it's her turn now really to go and work. So she's kind of at the start just really cross with him that he's failed to come home and when she starts trying to work out where he is and she um get, gets contact with the department who are the the governing body they basically tell her to kind of shelter in place they don't use those words but that's now how i'm seeing it um not to do anything they they try and kind of placate her and they in a very veiled way basically threatened to take her kids away and put them in a best life estate um, if she doesn't comply with, with their demands and and she gets spooked um, and so she she takes off first to her um, the family farm where she grew up where her mum is um, and then from there as that becomes untenable also um, up on this kind of epic road trip across Australia and I don't think it's a spoiler because I've talked about it so much but then onto a onto a boat she boards a, a yacht to get to Indonesia in the hope of both finding Ben and by this stage keeping herself and the kids safe. Mm. So there is very much that sense of uh, geotech is this um, awful, just chilling, horrible, let's be as nice as pie. It's a little bit Stepfordy wives yeah. type vibe, but much more sin sinister. And these best life. Uh, wonderful communities that you can go and live in are, are, are really, I mean, I have to say, um, I had to read most of this book in the broad daylight because I don't do scary books. Um, but this, I, I found this really, really scary because I thought this, this, this can be happening. We are creating places like this. There are people in the world who have hunkered down in these best communities uh yeah really scary stuff. they are scary and you know i i have to say that my um my dear uh parents-in-law um used to live just out, outside of bendigo and we live in in hurstbridge and so we would um drive up out, out the back way um through the back of kind of hurstbridge and and up um, to visit Bendigo. And, and one of the things that we noticed over that time in the space as you're leaving Melbourne is just more and more of these um, estates popping up. And I, I used to teach in one too. And, you know, everything they sell about these extraordinary communities, there's everything that you need here, beautiful houses, um, these green areas. And, and yet, of course, there wasn't. There, there was none of the infrastructure. Um, at times, I remember when I was uh, teaching at the, the primary school that I was working at out there, you know, if there was a fire threat, you couldn't get out of the place because it hadn't been designed in a way that you could actually leave. And so, um, you know, I know many of my readers will live in places like that, and it's certainly not a um, a criticism of them themselves. But the way in which that infrastructure is set up, um, and we're led to, you know, try and buy into this idea Th those big signs you see of you know the laughing family and everything's wonderful and happy because they'll live by the lake, and it's just bullshit, really, honestly. Um, and I and I also my husband um, is a uh, a psych nurse. He works with uh, the homeless Aboriginal community in, here in Melbourne, and that idea too of the the types of um, programs that are bought in, you know, to keep people safe off the streets. Um, the idea of in places where the streets are swept uh, before the Olympics, for instance, before big events to get people out of the way, not necessarily for their own good, but for the look of it too. So they were all the kinds of ideas that were at play with the, um, with the best life estates. And, and that idea too of this government, and I talk, talk about it in the book where, you know, she kind of tries to think back, like, how did we let it get to this? How, how did we, how did we, you know, know this was happening? We watched, but we didn't see is what she says. Um, and I think that that's really very possible. We can all see how that, that happens to us a, a, as well. So yes, I have got lots of comments from people that it's, that it's a bit terrifying. Mm. But, but I think it's also a real wake up call for us because 
I think COVID has made so many people stop and think about what's going on. And we've, we've had to reflect on our inner landscape. And some of us have been better at doing that in the past and some not. And I think one of the things that appeals to me so much about this book and, and why I just will be driving everybody nuts, making them read it, no family <laughs> and friends, um, is because a couple of things jump out at me. One, that really scary boiling lobster, um, you know, lobster in the pot, which you've just talked yeah. about. And, and also that, that horrible uh slide from government into corporations mm. who are there to make money and do their best but actually ultimately it's not the best thing for you but no. but by the time you wake up and realize you're really in a matrix type situation it's too late yeah uh, and and i and i think what i love about the mother fault is that uh, Mim wakes up early enough mm. and and she's able to do something, not for everybody, but she's able to do something for herself and mm. her family. Yes. I love that you say that. That's a, a great um, analogy to draw too, because I think that is true. That is the hope as we come out of, of these COVID times. I watched um, the new David Attenborough with my oh. uh, kids this week and we all kind of wept uh, as we were watching it and then stood up at the end and and kind of gave it a, a standing ovation um as we do in our family um but it but it gave us pause to think okay well we can come out of this and and do something different like that's what we need to do we don't want to go back to normal and i think yes mim does it because she gets this shock of her husband disappearing like this is the the um the crazy the inciting incident for the writers there that, that causes everything to kind of unravel and i think um to some extent when i've talked with my friends and other mothers that was partly the experience of having my first child as well and of all of us having our first child that we were women um i, I did have my kids at the same time as at the same age as my mum did because she probably did a little bit late I saw someone ask before my mum's name is Liz um oh. and she um but you know we had careers and uh we were used to running our lives as we wanted them to and we you know stepped out every telling everyone that we were going to you know do it really well like no one else has ever done we we're going to share everything with our partner it was going to be oh so great and you know I can hear people laughing at me just as I even say it because because of course it wasn't like everything fell apart. Our work fell apart. We didn't get our necessarily our jobs back. And if we did, we didn't get them at the same level or the, uh, you know, we didn't go up the, the scale at the same time. And, and also we were sold this dream that um, we would be, we would feel so utterly complete um, when we had our children as well. Um, and of course that, that's not true either. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so much of that experience um i remember of being home in those early days and i and i probably suffered for quite some time with anxiety that um wasn't that wasn't diagnosed at the time mm -hmm. but you know it was it was so hard it was yeah. so hard and then also feeling like oh, everyone knew this and no one told us <laughs> so i think and a lot of you can't you can't be told until you can't you're there. You could you don't listen. <laughs> no, and of course well, now I'm in a position much. of having bigger kids. I do exactly the same and listen with this beautiful smile on my face as people tell me that you know they're having their first children and they'll do it differently too. And and so we can't be told. But I think I was um I was frustrated that I wasn't reading more and I read so much. I I read so much, but the people that I I wasn't seeing necessarily on my screens or in my books were um, I was seeing women who are ambivalent about their marriage and, and their kids maybe, but then I wasn't seeing them um, as the, as the hero mm -hmm. and, and doing this kind of, um, you know, going out and, and getting messy and doing someone in a, a great review compared Mim to like, you know, Liam Neeson in Taken. And I was like, yes, that's, that's right. Because we should be allowed to have action heroes who are mums and who are also dealing with like, oh, I can't really wait for you to have a poo because I've got it. Like we've got to go. Yeah. Um, because yeah. that's the reality <laughs> of having to do it with kids. And, and, and so often our male characters, um, even if they are fathers, don't have to do that. No, no. And, and, um, 
one of the things that that I just thought was so clever about the book was um, I'm I'm always keen to see how much the characters progress in terms of their self development, and you know we we start the book and in a way Mim can't do anything right and she's sort of bouncing up against everybody the kids especially and I I loved that you were able to um, let Essie evolve and let that relationship between Essie and Mim evolve because it again in terms of without sounding like I'm doing a happy la la um, you know, and you get six free steak knives with this book as well. <laughs> um, what, what I really loved was that Essie is a, a she's a pain in the backside at the yeah, start. Yeah, she book, is. But she grows as well and she mm. comes to understand the complexity of Mim and, and the fact that no one's got it all right, but no one's yep. made all the mistakes. Um, and, uh, yeah, can you yeah, she was, tell us a little she was, bit about where that relationship came from? So um, Essie was an, an utter joy to write. And I actually looked back in my journal recently and I very early on, I did a great course with um, Tony Jordan, the masterful writer and teacher. She's such an incredible teacher. And um, it, it was probably too early on to do the course, but we, we chatted about the book and I was, I was struggling with writing their kids at that stage. And she said, flip them, flip, flip the gender or the age or the interests. And so I did that really early on and it just, Essie just leapt off the page then. She was terrific. So I started that. And then another, um, I'm very lucky to live where I live and I have a gorgeous writers group who include um, the writers, Zana Freylon, um, fantastic middle grade writer, Penny yeah. Harrison, the, the picture book writer and Penny Russon, who's a YA writer. And she did an early read for me. Um, and she said at the end, Kate, you know that this is a love story between, between Mim and Essie, don't yeah. you? Like, and it was, it was so wonderful to have someone articulate that to me because I think there's things, the writers will know this, there's things that we know about what we're writing, but, but we are unable to, to articulate them at some point. So so once I kind of embraced that idea of it being between Mim and Essie, at the same time as my darling um, firstborn was growing older, as she's now, uh, as I said, nine, but going on about 17. And so I was also go going through that phase of having had um, a small child who is completely reliant on me to that kind of um, moment where she, they start pushing you away <laughs> very uh, angrily sometimes and also having to navigate so never more than we have in in lockdown I must say but navigate that you know this is me and I am my own person I have also got my own needs and wants as as an adult as a woman as your mother mm -hmm. um so so that was easy to kind of fold into this this um relationship that was building as well and I also knew right from the start and and um I, I won't spoil it but i knew where i was going with the book and and while i rewrote the ending um many many times um many times um the the final image was was always the same and i knew what i was heading towards so um you know she was a joy to write it also meant that in all of that kind of angsty difficult stuff and the the politics and um that very kind of adult navigating of the sexual tension and the rest of it, that I just had this joy of writing the kids um, mm -hmm. and the, sometimes the things that they would say, but also the fact that they were on every page yes. because she was caring for them and yes. they had to be, and I could never get rid of them as is our life when we are raising small children. Um, and, and so that was interesting to do as a writer too, because that, we don't necessarily see that a lot um, when it's an adult book written from an adult um, character's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of fun to play with because sometimes they had to act out and, and sometimes they demanded to, to have place on the, on the page too. And I think also that adds, you know, whether you realise you were doing it or not, but it adds that urgency to it because it, it, it creates that claustrophobia of really she can't let them, almost out of her sight no. because what is going to happen to her and and one of the things that i that i also wanted to um raise with you and it, it comes up really early and i'm i can't remember the name of the character i should she's a very very mm, 
sweet as, you know, Butterwood Melton Her Mouth media woman who's going to come in and smooth over. And, and if this should happen, then you might like to play it in this way. And we'll position you so that you don't appear to be the baddie. Or, yeah. And you just think, hang on a sec, what how Lindy Chamberlain must have felt like this. Yeah all of a sudden hang on uh no my husband is missing how will how all of a sudden did i become the main suspect yeah. in his disappearance um she, she is ugh, she's a yeah. yucky character she she's really difficult and but and i think what i was what i was playing there too you know one of my my greatest ever fears and i love um watching film and TV that does this and reading, uh, reading books as well is, is that idea when, when you're completely stuck, there's nothing you can do, you know, mm -hmm. that everything is against you. And, and this idea that, um, that the mim couldn't argue her way. Like if they were going to frame her, um, and take the kids off, there was nothing that she could do, mm -hmm. um, except to run. But I also think that really powerful media image while I was reading this, uh, researching this, I, I had a lot of Google alerts on, you know, um, disappearing mums, terrible mums, um, criminal mums. And, and, you know, what would happen is that every time a new story would break where a mum had done something terrible, um, just the way that the media frames it every single time, you just, you cannot take a break. You can't, um, look the wrong way. You know, with the Lindy Chamberlain case, you can't respond in the wrong way. You can't not cry. You can't cry too much. You're putting it on, you know, the, this idea that, um, that we are stuck. And that was, that was playing with that idea of the fault as well. You know, it's always going to be her fault. She's, I've seen some um, feedback from one book club, I think where, you know, people were arguing, well, she should never have left. Like she should have left the kids here. She should have done this. She should have done that. Um, and I think, well, that's representative of, of what society would do as well. Have everyone would have their two cents worth. So I think, um, you know, and, and having said too, I should also mention that, um, in, in the work that Adam does, um, the, the fact that kids are continue to be taken away from, from their parents in this country, uh, at a rate greater than they ever have been before, mm. particularly in, in Aboriginal communities. And, um, you know, it's, it's so frightening that that continues to be the threat that we, that we hold against mothers in particular, I think. Mm. It's so and, and I, and I, yeah, look, the, I think that's a great point because, the idea on paper what she's doing you know dragging her kids around looks to the government as if she is the worst mother in the world because she's putting the children in all this danger but but actually sometimes you can't protect your children from the dangers you've got to let them bleed you've got to let them break bones they've got to discover that stuff for themselves and they'll hate you for it, <laughs> but hopefully they'll come out the other side, uh, and 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 you'll discover a, a new relationship together. And that that was um, I, I just found it so filmic um, that, and I, I don't want to give it away, but one of the the last scenes um, when we see Essie really coming into her own, I'm going to mime what she's doing so that it's not a spoiler. <laughs> yes. Okay. Got it. Yes. Um. And I could just see the camera shot coming in on her and all of a sudden we see, right, this is pass the baton to the next generation. Yeah. Mim has done a wonderful job with Essie. Essie has survived, will continue to survive. Uh, and she's now been given that space to, mm. to grow and then, and to go on. And I think aren't the young people in our lives astonishing? Like I, oh, I just continue yeah. to find them so astonishing in um, that strength. Also in their wisdom, I think too, during the pandemic, what's been extraordinary is I, I love that idea that um, it's a Morris Sendak quote and I, I never get it right, but he basically says, you know, the kids, the kids always know, like yeah. they always know the terrible thing that's happening. They may not be able to um, conceive of it in the same way that we do with our adult experience, but they know that something's wrong or going on, or they, they approach it with that um, innocent kind of wisdom, which just gives you so much clarity sometimes. And I think um, that's, that, that's also something that uh, of all the things that um, have made me 
angry and that I wanted to tease out in the book because they were questions that I had or things that were frustrating me in the society around us. One of the great joys has been watching these kinds of social movements led by young people who are just saying, you know, we can't wait. We can't wait for you lot to sort out how you're going to deal with this. So we'll, we'll do it for you. Um, and I think that's incredibly inspiring. Yeah. And I think also they, what, what I find, I, I'm lucky enough, um, I've got three gorgeous adult sons and they, they've all come home for COVID, which is, has been my saving grace in COVID, yes. but really tough for them. And, and I think that that sense that um, they are prepared to call it when they see it, you know, they don't let you get away with anything. No. Um, but, but also they are not, defeated and I and I think a lot of older people uh, they talk down to young people they say yeah they're lazy they've got no ideas they're followers all the rest of it well actually look at the young people around the world there are more young people as you say making a difference mm. than all the oldies mm. in in official uh, positions yeah. of power Definitely. um can you has anyone called for um a sequel another call <laughs> so I'm many people, people. I, oh they have oh, okay oh that's so right. many I'm people thinking. which is delightful is that a bit and of question no 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 but only that um it's it's lovely uh it's it's really lovely and so many people have asked for it and um in that way too, there's, there's been, of course, as there always is, or there often is with, with books, but it ta always takes a very long time, some discussion of, of film and TV. And in a way, I think that what I would most like is to uh, let someone else take it. The, the great joy of, um, of writing a book like this that I've been in for, for four years that nearly at times nearly at times really honestly and for people who've listened to the first time podcast didn't make it um to to book form was um getting to the end of it and 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 finishing it and saying okay i've 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 done what I can with these characters and I've got them to where I needed to uh, mm -hmm. and there's absolutely you know um kind of more that I've written that I that I never put in or ways that I imagined um the characters going forward but it, it it was also a very natural end that, like mm. I said before, um, for me, but I love, I mean, I loved watching the, the adaptation of, of Handmaid's Tale. And I, I particularly loved it for that sense that it is, um, it's just, it's so small, that moment of slippage where, where you think everything's normal and then suddenly it's just not, and then where it goes from there. Um, so I love what people are, are doing in, in film and TV. And that might be one way that there's a, that there's a sequel for it. Um, but it's, it's so exhausting. Your writers in the audience will know this is so exhausting being in, in a book. Um, and then once you, I've only done it twice, as you, as you pointed out at the start, but there's this point where, and it happened in Skylarking um, before it was published, where I had the idea for the mother fault and I wrote it down on a piece of paper and I said, do not open this document until Skylarking is done. And it happened again um, in the writing of the mother fault where I got the idea for, for the new book, book three. And then it starts building up um, in this kind of wave. <laughs> Until you go, okay, okay, I have to, I have to put everything aside and, and go with this new book now. So that's where I'm at the moment. So it's kind of, it's this lovely um, feeling to get people talking about a sequel, but I'm also very much, very deep into the next book too. Wow. Uh, well, we, we look forward to Reese, Reese Witherspoon picking it up. Putting yes, it please. Role. Yes, please. Casting. Her daughter would be old enough to play Essie. Yes. It's so interesting thinking. And of course, um, the one, I don't know if anyone's listened to the, um, to the audio book version, but, um, Claudia Carvin reads, oh, reads the book. The other one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yes. And that's quite, and she sent me a very gorgeous note, um, after, after reading it and just said, you know, she was, she was so moved in the reading and that she also had to pause at times, um, because she was so emotional in the reading and, you know, to know that it connected with her so much and to get the kind of feedback I'm getting from people who are listening, listening to the book and just say, Oh my gosh, like Claudia is a Claudia is Mim now. Um, so that's lovely too. It, it's, it's, it, 
terrifying experience, but it's also so gratifying when your book goes out into the world and you start getting these kinds of private messages, some of them and, and, and public messages and reviews and things like that. And you think, Oh gosh, she's, she's connected, you know, like Mim has really truly connected. Um, and that's all, all a writer can ask. Mm. I wanted to ask before I throw it open and if people can start, I I'm trying to keep track of, um, Rosemary can keep prompting me if I've, if I've missed any. Um, but one of the things I was really interested in was, um, uh, Mim's relationship with Ben, her husband. Mm. So he, you know, because FIFO marriages and FIFO families are such a huge part of, of many communities around Australia or pockets of communities mm. around Australia. And I was really interested in what you as a person felt about Ben as a character as you went on writing the story. Mm. Could That's you separate a great question. it out from what Min was feeling? Um, at, at times, I mean, I, I pretty much fused with her at times as well, but one of the things that I did do as I, is I, that I have thousands and thousands and thousands of words of, um, Mim and Ben's backstory. Mm. Um, you know, so many words, their whole kind of relationship in its entirety. And I, I needed to do that for myself because I knew that Ben wouldn't be on the page very much. And mm. to get a reader to go with me, and to go with Mim on this extraordinary journey and to put herself and the kids in such risk at such risk for this man. Mm. Um, I, I knew that there, there had to be, um, you know, a, a great love and desire, desire and respect there in that relationship. So that was, that was really helpful for me having all of that. And, you know, at, at times I wrote it in and then I took it out, but, but there's this extraordinary amount of, of material. Mm. And I think also that, um, I believed in at, at different times, I believed in what, what Ben believed in and, and what, what he was doing too. Um, it, and what I'm interested in, I, I mean, I'm, I make kind of no judgment in the book. I, what, the question that I'm asking is, um, what do we, what do we risk for the things that we believe in and, and hold dear? And, and it, it, I don't think it is a spoiler to say, um, that there's a part closer to the end where, you know, Mim thinks like I, I could have done something heroic too, mm. but I was at school pickup, you know, yeah. cause that's what my life is. And so I haven't been able to make those, um, those decisions or those great acts, um, like other people might have. And so having those conflicted feelings ar around Ben was really important. Tony Jordan, one of the other things that Tony Jordan said really early on, which was so useful is she said to me, Kate, if Mim's so unhappy in the marriage, why hasn't she left before the book starts? Mm -hmm. And it was a great question. Like the, the best people that you work with as writers, the editors and the people in your writing groups and the readers are the people who ask those kinds of questions. And it was terrific because it made me realize that, um, you know, there had to be, there had to be something in there that she was willing to fight for in, in that relationship. And, um, part of it was the role that Ben plays as dad. And he he's a good dad for the most part. Um, and, and this whole history that she has also the feeling that, um, she needs him. Yeah. And I think one of the things I was exploring too, is that feeling I certainly had when the kids were born of, of becoming really de-skilled in lots of areas of my life, because I handballed them over. Um, so that, that was, that was part of that, um, I was part of that too. And when I said before that I rewrote the endings, the ending many times in part, that was because of the different ways that I was dealing with Ben. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and because of the multitude of feelings, um, both positive and negative that I, that I have about him and, and his actions too. It's interesting. Cause I, I, um, have an ambivalence towards Ben. Um, and you know, and it came and went, you, yep the job of manipulating me as a good as a writer um but one of the things i just kept coming back to thinking was um it's never the ben fault it's never the father fault no. <laughs> it's not you know he gets to do things as you say be a, a, a hero but he also gets away with stuff that oh. we won't let women and mothers no. get away with uh no. and i and, and you, you weren't heavy handed about it, but 
but it, it will be interesting to see, uh, and I've not read a lot of reviews um, about the mother fault yet because it's only come out in September, but I would love to eavesdrop on a whole lot of uh, book, other book clubs uh, and maybe some of the people in this book club can comment uh, if, you've, if you've read it or from what you've heard us talking about Ben now. Um, wh why, why doesn't Ben get blamed? Yeah, well, I think that's... <laughs> I mean, I've had this, this conversation most recently with the, my many um, gorgeous girlfriends and, you know, I, I know and adore all of their, their partners as well. Um, but, you know, everything that, that people have found during lockdown, particularly during this pandemic that, you know, we've, we've gone back like 50 years in terms of the, um, the kind of domestic workload, the fact that a lot of the time fathers are getting great kind of feedback and kudos in their work for having a child on their lap in, in a, in a meeting momentarily, but then, you know, they don't necessarily go and then also organize the dinner, the three phone calls to the family members, um, you know, everything else that needs to be, to be done along with worrying about the climate crisis, the general economic, you know, I think that the, the, that mental load that, that women mostly bear is, is so extraordinary and, and men just don't necessarily uh, uh, see it um, or experience it. And I think, yeah, certainly that was, that was part of my anger and, and resentment at times that was coming <laughs> through in the book, my own personal, that, uh, you know, here we go again with, um, you know, a bloke getting to have the job, the opportunity, the, all the rest of the things and not worry about that day to day when I go away and, you know, my uh my partner's fantastic but uh when i go away as i often do on a writer's retreat haven't this year but often do um for a week because it is the equivalent of about three months of work for me when i go away for a week i i start writing at eight i write until six i get so much work done you know i leave a, a spreadsheet a a calendar like the entire village is organized to make sure the kids uh get where they have to be because i i hold it as many women do in my head all the, all of that stuff so you know, um, yeah, I think, I think that's important. I can see a question there from Cecile about, you know, is she there because she needs an adult alongside her on the journey rather than still being deeply in love? And yes, you know, yes, I think that is, that is partly true. I think there's that, um, aging, um, of, of love between them. And she, she, she does have some really fond memories of, um, of what it was at the start. But I think a lot of that is nostalgia for that as well. And I think, you know, from the, from many of the women that I talk to, um, it's, it's the easiest choice to stay. <laughs> it's the practical choice. Um, when, when some of that, when some of that goes, and I think that's, um, without giving spoilers, the kind of the temptation that, um, that shows itself in the, the form of an old flame in Nick in the book is, um, is part of a searching for that, um, aspect of herself, which, you know, is, made visible again, this younger self, this kind of person who is capable of, of both desire and being desired is something that she has just, um, that has been subsumed by her role as, as a mother. And I think that's what happens so much. And I think actually, um, it's something that uh, someone else said, are men reading it? And, and yes, they are, but they are coming at it in a really different way. And I had a conversation with Jock Sarong, the, the writer, earlier this week, a great conversation. Um, but he was kind of saying, we don't treat women, women characters in the same way in terms of our expectation around temptation and desire. Men, men get away with far more than we allow our female characters to do. And, and I had to be very careful and lots of editors and um, potential readers said to me during the process, you've got to be careful how you play this with, with men because um, people won't like her. And, and that's another difficult thing we do to our female characters. Yeah. And I think um, the, what for me, what um, the, the, when she reconnects with Nick again, and you do it so, so deftly, she's just conscious, you know, at one stage she touches her hair and put, and then she says, Oh, can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. and there's all these really subtle signaling that's going on and it absolutely sizzles because you realize she, she can't, she's already the fault of so many other things. Yeah. You can't add this to, to her list of things she's going to be blamed for. Um, but as you say, 
flip the roles and if it had been Ben, oh. you know, you'd say, well, it's really tough for him because yeah. he's yeah, off right? and he's with the exactly. kids and, you know, they've got a lot in common, him and Nick. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting the the way we read it. Um, now there's a fabulous question here. Um, following on from a men reading it, uh, you mentioned starting with the image of a boat, uh, and the the person saying, "Was that oh. anything to do with the incredible bushfire image of the family on the boat?" That's that wasn't that an incredible image. Um, no, in terms of timing, it wasn't. Um, it was much more to do with um, asylum seeker images, and and that's a lot of what my early reading was reading um, stories, mostly first hand accounts of of women who were fleeing. What that that bushfire image um, was really important for is that we actually, um, my family and I, camp in in Far East Gippsland over the summer, and we were evacuated. Um, from a, from a new fire that came up near Point Hicks, the Wing and Inlet fire. Um, and we had 15 minutes to get out of our campground that we've camped at for 30 years. So we had to leave all our stuff. Um, and it was relatively scary and we lost it all. The, ca the entire um, campfire, the campground burned and our trailer and all those things, which are very um, small in the scheme of, of what was lost. But, but we were kind of deeply... Um, um, involved in a way in that we, we drove all the way back to Melbourne through the night that night. Um, and what happened in terms of those bushfires is of course, I'd, I'd written into the book, this, you know, this near future, this kind of, you know, 10, 15 years in advance is what I talk about it being about. Um, and I had, I'd written scenes about landscape changed by fire and I hadn't written them far enough. So that idea I had, I did have the word unprecedented in the book, but I kind of uh, doubled down on it and I had to change those scenes where she's driving um, kind of through Vic and up into New South Wales um, because this kind of projection that I had of these great fires had already come to pass in, in, in our time. So I think, you know, I, I was conscious that this was a book about lots of, of, um, big issues, I suppose, that are impacting us. And I, um, I never wanted it to be kind of read as cli-fi necessarily. And there's lots of talk about genre and how that impacts on readers and the rest of it. But I knew also that it was, um, my imperative as a writer to in include it, um, and to do it in that way that, you know, people have said, uh, have contacted me to say that the scariest scene for them was when Mim just, you know, it's only a sentence. <laughs> she looks down when they're at the marina in Darwin and you can see the old yacht club um, because they've just floated the, the, all the marinas in Darwin up higher um, because of course sea level change would um, really greatly impact, impact Darwin. So, um, you know, it was important to, to note, to kind of weave those things through. And, and this terrifying thing is, is that for a writer writing near future realism in this country is that, uh, you know, it's moving faster than we can write and publish books. That's what's been so interesting about the kind of um, Alice Smith experiment in the way that she's writing those books, because you actually can't keep up at the moment with the, the rate of change. No. I wondered to, cause I, you're right. When, you know, if you, if you did a sort of, um, a description and audit of how many big issues uh, has Kate Milgram, <laughs> Milgram Hall <laughs> put into this book? You'd go, oh, that's a pretty packed book. But I wonder whether the way you've got around it is obviously a very deft writer, but because you've hung it off the framework of Kate and Ben's relationship and you've used backstory almost to sort of um, soften and take the heat out so you, you you're constantly i mean it's a if you were trying to graph this book it, it it's a very wonderfully spiky graph because you put us into scary situations and then you take us into the backstory or you just drop a sentence about what may or may not have happened mm. uh and it it sort of takes the heat out of it I'm glad that that's the experience for the reader. It's certainly, um, you know, so many drafts, so many drafts of this book, Sarah, and like really vastly different drafts as well at different times. I had the, um, the great kind of privilege of working with Charlotte Wood during this, she, Charlotte mentored me during the writing of this book. Um, and that was particularly, I reached out to her because I was so interested in the way she talked about 
writing the natural way of things and, and how she, it took her a while to work out the form of the book. So that's, that's why I, I wanted to start working with her. But one of the things she did, which was so powerful is at the start of the mentorship, she said, you know, like what, think of an image that you want to um, have reached at, at the end of the book, at the end of this project. And I had this image of um, a cube, which had all these ideas in it, you know, surveillance, privacy, motherhood and desire um you know so many ideas mining um <laughs> geography mm -hmm. and um i wanted to have touched all the ideas in the box that was my idea and i think you know at different times in different versions of course you you double down you know like when i was reading about mining and um and the types of activism that happens in places like Indonesia and the threat made on people's lives and the fact that people are killed as they are trying to protect, protect their lands. You know, I, the, the draft reflected that the draft reflected what I was in. And so that, that process of editing over and over again and, and working with different people really, um, I think allowed me to get that, that balance right when I was dealing with so many of those issues that I wanted to touch in the box. Mm -hmm. Well, look, it's nearly time to go. Ah. <laughs> I, just, I just want, and this is, this is, um, as you know, I sent you sort of 45 pages of questions, but anyway, <laughs> I loved um, it. this I think is a, a, a much more important question. And, and, and it comes up time and time again, when we're talking with authors, you are so generous with your time and being involved um, with other writers and different projects. It all, it must cut cut into your time as an author yourself. What what impact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, look, I I've been very privileged this last um couple of years to be supported both by my my partner, so I haven't had to do um kind of any kind of full-time other work so I've been able to write and at different times that has also been I've been teaching um and doing other work that the side hustle that writers need to do um the podcast is is something entirely different and that's an absolute passion project that makes us no money whatsoever but is a joy it's such a joy and I'm not one of those writers who has to um not read i mean there's certain books that are, if they were very close um for instance i didn't read um bruni by heather rose I, I was probably up to the editing stage when that came out and i was like okay i'm not going to read that because i know that's quite close in terms of what it's trying to do um but otherwise like i'm a bower bird i read as much as i can i always when i go on a retreat i have um, a massive stack of books with me and some of it will be fiction some poetry and then a lot of it will be writers talking about writing mm -hmm. um because i always find that at different times i you, you know you pick up a book and it's just that bit that you need about endings or beginnings or you know how to fix a character a character plot problem mm -hmm. and and so interviewing people for the podcast has been extraordinary because everyone has this kind of generous gift to give in terms of the story that they tell. But also when it was really hard in the middle of the last four years, when I lost my publisher and I lost the contract that I had, what was extraordinary was to be able to say, look at all these incredible writers mm -hmm. that I'm interviewing. And they've all had this, whether or not they say it during our interview or whether they're the type of writer who wants to tell me afterwards when we've turned off the recording. Um, what I gained from that was this feeling that what is important is the work and the writing. And, and so I think that gave me the strength to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to finish this book because this book is, has been everything to me for the last couple of years and whether or not it's going to get published, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to see it through to the end. Um, and those interviews also gave me the skills to be able to reach out then to different people and say, okay, what am I going to do now? How am I going to find myself an agent? How am I going to find myself a publisher? Mm -hmm. Well, all power to your arm, girl. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Rosemary. I um, just, what a privilege. Thank you so much for, for being our very first book. Oh, I'm honoured to have been your first guest. I think it's so fantastic. And I love how, I'm not going to use the P word, um, but I love how people are being so creative in adapting to this new environment um and doing these virtual you know it's gorgeous this is i won't go back inside now for a moment i'll sit here with my drink and feel like i'm out having a drink with you all afterwards 
Absolutely. And and it's been so wonderful. Not only have you been able to join us in our own little um, book club, but we've been able to see into your... Uh, yes! Uh, anyway, that's it's for my another, studio. I have that's for another whole beautiful, series. My beautiful painting, which my mum, who I talked about before, had made for me, which is me in my studio with my girls going crazy around me celebrating my book. Um, uh, so that's what's propped up in the corner here. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, hopefully we'll one day meet in um, person. I would love and that. In the meantime, everybody, if you have not got yourself a copy of The Mother Fault, uh, I did falsely advertise that it comes with six free steak knives. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you'll get to the end of it and you won't want your money back. So lovely to have Sarah, met. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for reading so generously and for your fabulous questions terrific and thank you all so much for coming if i could give every question a, a, a little clap i would thank you big elephant stamps for everyone well everybody <laughs> have a great night and uh go on reading and uh rosemary will have some something waiting for us next and uh tune in next time take care Kate. thank you thank you sarah thanks rosemary thank you all for coming <laughs>